On MedCast Plus, we aim to bring local healthcare providers and physicians to discuss important topics relevant to our health and well being. Nan for that introduction and thank you to you and the borough president um, and your office for bringing us together today um, to highlight this important issue and um, it is a call to action for all of us um, and as you said Nan and as I will repeat everyone in this room has a role to play in combating the crisis that we're in and so I hope everyone here today takes home some information and also some skills that you can put to use um, and we're going to start um, so I'm going to be speaking um, followed by my colleague Dr. Lucas Dreamer we're going to give you some of the backstory and then we're going to turn it over to the Department of Health to um, to follow through so I'm sure everyone in this room is probably here because you know that we're in the middle of a crisis. Um, and I'm going to spend some time, though, highlighting what that means um, when we say we're in an opioid crisis. What does that mean? And then we're going to talk about um, ways we can respond and ways we are responding and ways we must continue to respond to this crisis if we're going to see a change. So what is this opioid crisis that everyone's talking about? Um, you're going to see some data here that you'll probably see again. I borrow from the Department of Health because they're the best source of information that we have about what's going on specifically in New York City. Um, but I just want to open with this because it makes me pause every time I read it. So in New York City, that's just New York City, every six hours someone is dying from a drug-related overdose. That's an unintentional overdose, an accident, not an intentional suicide, an accidental drug overdose. Every six hours. So like, sit with that. That's, that's pretty remarkable. Um, and we've been seeing a, a, a sharp increase over the last, really up till eight years now. You could see sort of starting in 2010, that line going up year by year in terms of the number of overdose deaths that we're seeing in New York City. And I have data here through 2016. I can assure you that line has continued to go up for the last couple of years. We just don't have complete data that I can present to you um, at this time. What does that mean? How do we look at that in a different way? More New Yorkers are dying from overdose than homicide, suicide, and motor vehicle accidents combined. Um, and in 2017, we had just under 1,500 
um, unintentional drug overdose deaths. And as I said, this is a, a, several consecutive years of rising rates of overdose death. So that's what's happening in New York City. Nan already touched a little bit on what we're here to focus on is what's going on in Brooklyn. And for years I kept hearing, well, Brooklyn has some of the lowest rates of overdose deaths in the city. And so if you look at this slide, this is data from 2016, you can see under the red arrow that Brooklyn does have per population one of the lowest rates of overdose deaths of the five boroughs. However, if you flip that and look at the raw numbers, because of Brooklyn's large population, we actually have the second highest number of overdose deaths of the five boroughs. Um, and this, again, is, is data from 2016, but that is held through to the current data as well. So this is a big problem right here in Brooklyn and in our communities. Um, so I'm curious, and I, and I, you know, taking this from numbers, to, to personal, to people, right? Um, if people are comfortable, how, how many people have been personally affected, friend, family member, neighbor, by this crisis? I certainly, I'm gonna raise my hand, right? So this is not just about numbers on a piece of paper. This is real lives being impacted and lost in our communities. Um, and so with that in mind, what are we gonna do about it? I'm gonna say a little more. Um, so those were just general overdose death rates. We know now that the vast majority of these deaths do involve an opioid. So 82%, this is data from 2017, so that's like a lot, um, do involve an opioid. So opioids are definitely driving this crisis of overdose deaths. Just to put us in perspective, I wanna just remind folks or, or educate folks about what we mean when we say opioids. All opioids are relatives of the poppy plant. So they're like nice little flowers, right, that grow. Um, but that's where heroin comes from. So they're naturally occurring opioids, and then they're opioids that we make in the lab. So things like codeine, fentanyl, Oxycontin, right, all over the news. Um, these are the common names that you'll hear. These are all things that are in the class of drugs called opioids that are driving these increasing overdose rates. What puts someone at risk for overdose from opioids? Um, so people who are using drugs that may be, they're not sure what's in it, may have an increased potency compared to what they're used to using. And that's the story of fentanyl that we're gonna focus on in a couple of minutes. Um, people actually coming out of treatment or coming out of jail who've had a period of abstinence, so they're not using for a little while, those folks are actually at heightened risk for overdose and death because their tolerance to the drugs has gone down during that period of time. And quite typically, they'll go back and use the same amount that they were using before entering treatment or before a period of incarceration. Um, and now their body is not used to the drugs, so the amount that they used to use on a regular basis can suddenly become lethal. So that's an important piece of education that we try to provide to anyone who's leaving our treatment programs, um, and also making sure those folks have access to naloxone, which we're gonna talk about a lot towards the end of today. Um, obviously, the higher the dose that someone is taking, whether that's by prescription or, um, or drugs on the, that they're getting from the street, increases the risk of overdose, and mixing multiple drugs. So folks who use alcohol plus other drugs or use pills, and opioids together, even cocaine mixed in. Anything that you mix in will increase the risk of, of death by overdose. So those are things that we watch out for and try to educate folks about to help reduce their risk. So I mentioned fentanyl as a culprit here, and I'm gonna focus on that a little bit because in the last few years, this is really a big part of the story of why that line that I showed at the beginning is going up and up and up. So 
Fentanyl is not a naturally occurring opioid like heroin. It is a synthetic or man-made opioid. What really defines addiction is the harmful social and health consequences that come from the continued use. And um, this phrase always sticks with me, the continued use despite harm, right? People know that what they're doing is harmful and dangerous, but something has shifted in the brain that makes that behavior continue. Um, and I think understanding that there is actually a shift that happens in the brain, that this is not a moral choice that people are making. We really come, have come to see addiction as a disease of the brain, where things are not regulated or controlled in a normal way anymore. And that's what drives these behaviors that continue to cause harm even when folks are well aware that the behavior is harmful. So that's what I wanted to give in terms of background for the opioid crisis, what crisis, what are we dealing with, and we're gonna shift now to talking about how we can respond to that crisis and how we are already responding to that crisis. Um, this is a lot of the work that we're doing here at Health and Hospitals is in the context of an initiative out of the mayor's office that launched in 2017. Um, it's called Healing NYC. You may have heard some of this in the media. Um, it's really a comprehensive effort to prevent overdose and also to provide in improved access to treatment for folks who are in trouble with their substance use and particularly opioid addiction. Um, and at this point, I'm gonna hand off to my colleague, Dr. Dreamer. He's gonna walk us through some of the other things that we can do and are doing to um, help address this crisis. Um, so thank you, Dr. Whitley, for starting this presentation. Um, the only other thank you I wanna give is to everybody sitting here. Um, thank you for taking time today to do this. It's only really by uh, all of us learning about this and taking responsibility for it that I feel like we can uh, make changes and improve uh, our communities. Um, so Dr. Whitley gave a great uh, introduction to the crisis that's been going on in, in Brooklyn, New York City, and across the country, uh, and talked some about the, uh, the opioids themselves and uh, addiction specifically. We're gonna talk a little bit more about uh, things we're doing here at Kings County and things that are being done elsewhere to try to combat um, opioid addiction and, and, and overdose. Um, so um, one thing we can do is uh, be more responsible as doctors and uh, be uh, safer in the way that we prescribe. Two ways that this is being done, both in New York State and elsewhere, is by prescription monitoring programs. Um, any prescription that is written for a controlled substance is reported by the pharmacies to this uh, database, to this registry. And any, any doctor has access to that, uh, helps us understand who might be seeing many doctors and getting many prescriptions from lots of places. Um, and has cut down on irresponsible prescribing. Um, a, second, um, a, a second way that we've improved um, responsible pr prescribing is by having any prescriber in New York State have to do a four and a half hour uh, education course about opioid medications and safe prescribing of them. Um, on the screen, you'll see the opioid risk tool, which is one tool that we can use to assess how uh, an, an individual patient's risk is for um, becoming uh, addicted or misusing medications. Um, both of these things have been successful in reducing um, prescribed opiates that are available and, and being on the black market and being sold on secondary markets and uh, being misused, um, which is a good thing. Um, uh, unfortunate side effect of this is that there has been an increase in use of other illicit op opiates, uh, such as heroin and fentanyl. Um, so another uh, strategy that uh, Healthy New York, Healthy NYC has done is to try to in in improve connections to care. Um, and the, uh, the principal um, component of treatment for opioid addiction uh, presently is medication. So what we call medication-assisted treatment is what's been most successful. Um, and there's a, a good list there of, of ways that uh, 
people are people do benefit from treatment. Uh, we say one thing: we're here to talk about overdose specifically. So being in treatment with uh, a few medications, we'll talk about in a minute, will uh, has been shown to reduce overdose risk, uh, reduces mortality, reduces um, drug use, improves social function, improves quality of life, improves social engagement. Um, one strategy that doctors use to identify patients who may be at risk is something called SBIRT, S-B-I-R-T, which is to have screening done at all, uh, front, by all frontline providers, primary care providers, uh, OBGYNs, uh, pediatricians, and then if, uh, when they identify patients who have risky use, uh, to do brief interventions then and refer them to other treatments uh, uh, as, as needed. And oftentimes that means uh, medications, uh, methadone, buprenorphine are two of the medicines we'll talk about. Um, so there are three approved medications uh, for treating opioid addiction, buprenorphine, methadone that I've just mentioned, and then a third one called naltrexone. Um, these may be familiar names to you. We're going to talk a little bit about them and how they're used. Uh, so methadone, I would guess most of you have heard of. It has a, a, a track record as a successful treatment going back to the 1960s. Um, it is itself an opioid, which is sometimes confusing to people. Um, the way it's different from, say, heroin is that it stays in your body for a very long time. So you have a very stable state, steady state, rather than highs and lows and highs and lows that are really a setup for uh, misuse of, of, a, of, a, of a substance. Um, you know, rather than thinking, always be thinking about uh, feeling high or feeling low and where the next uh, dose of, of a drug is going to come, come from, with methadone, really that is a steady state and it, it allows you not to think about your treatment so much, but to think about other, other components of your life and to try to, you know, get you back to, to a, a much more uh, steady life. Um, typically is given daily uh, in liquid form. Doses range from 60 to 100, although it can be quite a bit, or uh, typical doses are 60 to 100, although oftentimes it is quite a bit higher than that. Um, it can only be dispensed in uh, certified treatment programs. Um, in, in require, uh, an attendance is uh, required six out of seven days of the week um, for the first three months that you're in treatment can get a little bit more flexible after that. Um, and counseling is a requirement in these treatment programs, and most of them have medical and psychiatric services integrated into the program. Uh, a second medication that is also an opioid is buprenorphine. There's a few other names. Some may have heard it called Suboxone. It's been around for uh, a little over a decade um, and is also a quite successful treatment um, it, it, is not, it is an opioid, but it is sort of a partial activator opioid, which means if you have other drugs in your body when you take it, um, it might make you feel sick. It might give you withdrawal symptoms. So it's important to have been off of anything else for a couple days before starting it. Um, it is given as, an, as, a, as a tablet or a film that's given under the tongue and is dissolved there and enters the bloodstream through the, through the, through the mouth. Um, typical dosing is 4 to 24 milligrams. Um, can be pre prescribed in a treatment program similar to the way methadone is prescribed, but it can also be prescribed in um, a private, uh, in, in a doctor's or uh, office. So primary care providers who manage other aspects of your health can also provide this medication to you. Um, can be a little bit uh, more discreet, uh, more flexible. There's no requirement that you show up and take a single dose uh, each day at the beginning of treatment. That's really between you and your provider. Um, it's covered by most, most forms of insurance, uh, typically given once a day. Um, there are other uh, formulations that are being developed, that are developed, uh, an injection that's given uh, monthly, and then an implant that is, uh, lasts about six months. And then the third medication that uh, is available for treating opioid addiction is called nal naltrexone. And it is not an opioid, it is an opioid blocker, which means it covers the same uh, receptor, the same space in your brain, but rather than having any activity there, it's just like a closed door. 
So it prevents the effects of other drugs should they be in your body. For that reason, you have to wait about a week since you had anything else because this will completely block everything. And you'll go from here down to the ground very quickly and it can, can lead to with, withdrawal symptoms if all of the other medicines aren't, aren't processed out of your body. Um, it's approved for opioid addiction as well as alcohol addiction. So is, if there are patients who have uh, problems with both of those drugs, um, it can, can be a good choice there. Uh, so this slide shows uh, the this slide shows the um, the benefits of medication treatment in, in one study. So what we're looking at here is a group of patients, uh, all of whom were started on buprenorphine, um, some of whom were continued on the medication, some of whom were tapered out off after a couple of weeks, and some of whom were tapered off after about 12 weeks. Um, and you can see that the ones that were kept on the medication uh, had much uh, more success in avoiding use of other opioids. So clearly uh, is an aid in, uh, in promoting abstinence. Um, so how, how successful are these treatments? How good are these medications? Um, it would be great if they were 100% uh, effective and treating, and treating patients would guarantee that they would uh, have success. That's uh, unfortunately unrealistic. Um, you, you may say that a uh, 50% or less uh, success rate is not all that robust or all that great. I would say think about this. These are percentages, so think about 100 people. If we can successfully get a, a half of those people or more into treatment on a long-term basis, I think that that is indeed a success. Um, you know, as, as, as I said before, methadone has the longest uh, track record, uh, has the longest history of success, and is most successful in, uh, in treatment. Buprenorphine is close. Uh, buprenorphine has a high, uh, a maximum uh, treatment dose of about 24 milligrams. At higher doses, it just isn't really any more successful because it is, has so, the way methadone doesn't. And that, uh, that 24 milligrams is about, about equal to about 60 to 80 milligrams of methadone. And as I've said, you can go quite a bit higher with methadone. Um, now, Trexone, the numbers are not quite as good. Um, still is an option for people if, if, um, if uh, the treatment with the other medications is not an, is not an option. And then you look at you know, drug-free, meaning strictly an abstinence-only kind of uh, treatment strategy, or short-term detoxification would be where you go in the hospital or go into a program for a short period of time where you're given medicine to prevent the withdrawal. And once that's gone, um, you're, you're not given other treatment. And um, neither of those is really shown to be a very successful strategy, which is another, another argument to say that the medication-assisted treatment is is, is the best way to go. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, new, in, new innovations here, specifically at Kings County Hospital and, and other of the city hospital, other health and hospital uh, um, facilities. So uh, on, as part of the Kings County campus here, we do have an opioid treatment program that has provided methadone for, for many years. Uh, also can provide um, buprenorphine now and is also our hub for distribution of naloxone, something we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, we've also expanded uh, availability of uh, buprenorphine to other areas of the hospital, the primary care clinics, which is where I, I do my addiction work, as well as to the uh, outpatient psychiatry clinics and our substance use disorder treatment services, which historically haven't been uh, um, focused as much on medication-assisted treatment. They were more focused on um, more behavioral interventions. Um, and one other uh, brand new uh, project that we have here called the um, Emergency Department Addiction Leads uh, was just launched this month. And this is um, a, new, a new project focusing on our emergency rooms. A lot of people may come into and leave our emergency rooms, may come in for addiction-related problems or may not, but may have those problems. And uh, now we, we are having uh, situated in our emergency rooms both social workers and um, peer recovery counselors 
who can uh, connect with those patients and do some, some brief counseling and then connect them to other treatment uh, as, as needed. Um, so uh, Kings County also has, basically we try to have an open door for patients with uh, addiction problems. We have a central intake unit uh, where we can do screening, uh, counseling, evaluations, and referral to other treatments. <coughs> Um, it is right next door in the R building, which is right next door to where we are now. Um, we have a, a walk-in policy uh, Monday to Friday, and also um, you can arrange appointments. The phone numbers are there. Um, here's a little bit more information. Um, this is our most recent brochure, a little bit more information about the central intake unit, our um, chemical dependency program, as well as uh, across the street is where our opioid treatment program is. And as I've said, there are also uh, services in, in primary care and outpatient psychiatry. And then the third strategy that we're gonna spend the rest of today talking about and learning about is overdose prevention. Um, and you know that can be done through education, as we've been doing now, about what opioids are and how to identify an overdose and how to, how to reverse an overdose. Um, you know, you can train people to identify an overdose and use medication to reverse an overdose. And uh, I think from here, I'm gonna pass things along to Sequatia uh, Shannon from the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene to uh, give you more information and education about uh, naloxone and how it's used specifically. And then I believe we will break out and you can learn a little bit more and, and get a kit today. Come on up. So as mentioned before, my name is Shaquasia Shannon. I am an overdose prevention trainer from the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene here in New York City. And I'm going to walk you through how to respond to someone possibly experiencing an opioid overdose. So this is exactly what we want you to do, what we want you to say, information we need you to know. So as mentioned before, some of this information might be repetitive for the fact that you've already got some of the data of what's happening in New York City um, as well, but we're gonna quickly breeze through that and then understanding what an opioid overdose is and why naloxone is such an important tool, steps to responding. So once again, walking through those steps of response and then naloxone access. So this is on the page because we're gonna have a short discussion of how you can access naloxone outside of today. If you would like to get a kit, that is made possible, and we would just ask that you, at the towards the end, walk over to the tables that are on the right of the auditorium, where me and nursing staff from Kings County will be able to provide you with the kit. And questions are at the end. As a trainer, I like to take questions as we go along. It lets me know people are, are with me and paying attention. If I ask you to hold your question, because I know it gets answered later in the presentation, or even at a better spot, the way it makes sense why this answer is the way that it is. Is it okay with everyone that they'll hold the question? Yes, yes no, maybe, I like voices. Yes. Ah, thank you. So before we get deeper into training, I wanna make sure there are key terms that we remember. So before, there was a conversation of opioids. Let's see, let's do a quick test. Who remembers what an opioid is? Okay, great. So it works on very specific kinds of receptors, and we'll talk about that. Anyone knows what they're used for? Great, that is what I need you to remember. These are pain relievers. This is a very specific kind of pain reliever. When you're thinking of prescription painkillers, such as Vicodin, Percocets, those tend to go by the name as opioid analgesics. And then there are also other opioids, such as heroin and fentanyl. Fentanyl was mentioned before. There are two things I'm looking for very specifically about fentanyl. One was mentioned in the previous presentation. So yes, it is synthetic, yes. Anything, what about it? Great, so highly potent. That's number one, and the second one is fast acting. Because it's highly potent and fast acting, this has changed how the, the epidemic is playing out in New York City, as well as how this changes the timeline those who are responding have to respond. 
So this is really important that you remember that fentanyl is a highly potent, fast-acting opioid. And the last key term is naloxone. So it was mentioned that this can prevent overdoses from being fatal. Has everyone heard of naloxone? Have you heard of Narcan? Great. So if I asked you, I have a runny nose, does anyone have a Kleenex? Would you give me a tissue, even if it said it was puffs? Yeah. That's the kind of the same thing when it comes to naloxone and Narcan. Narcan is the brand name of a one-step formulation of naloxone. Naloxone is that generic name of, of the drug, of the active medication. So there are different kinds of formulations, and we'll quickly walk through that, but the forms that the formulation you'll get today if you take a kit is naloxone, is, is Narcan. So once again, it's a safe medication. I want you to remember that it's a safe medication to reverse the effect of an opioid overdose and prevent it from being fatal. So we're going to get into some data. We're going to quickly go through that. For seven consecutive years, as of 2017, we know for seven consecutive years, we have had increases in fatal overdoses. As it was mentioned before, we were at 1,487 people. So there's a major spike from 2015 to 2016, and we pretty much know that that spike is due to the involvement of fentanyl in our drug supply. So we'll have a little bit a more detailed conversation about that. So this is a map of the five boroughs, and is looking very specifically at the rate of over, fatal overdoses in New York City in 2017. So the deeper a shade of blue you see, the higher the rate it is in that neighborhood. Where are you seeing the different shades of blue in New York City? Bronx. Staten Island. Where are you seeing shades of blue? The reality is you see it everywhere. So a lot of times our eyes go to the deep, dark, shaded colors, right? So we saw the Bronx, we saw Staten Island. There's only one spot on this map that is not a shade of blue, and that is Central Park. Every part of New York City is being impacted by this epidemic. Every community has lost someone. So we really have to acknowledge the work that we have to do in addressing this, because this is a citywide thing. So as mentioned before, we have had these numbers. In 2017, we know that the highest rate and the largest number of fatal overdoses were in the Bronx. And that was mentioned. When I asked you, where do you see these, these shaded areas? On that map, the Bronx was easy to say. You saw those deep, dark shades of blue. But we're not right now in the Bronx, are we? We're in Brooklyn. And as mentioned before from Dr. Whitley, when you look at just the rate, you wouldn't necessarily see why it's important to have this conversation, to have this training in Brooklyn. But when you look at the number, the individuals that have died and that are no longer in our community, we see that, and that is in the graph in pink on the, on the right side of the screen, we see that Brooklyn comes in second. In 2017, Brooklyn had 359 people no longer in their community because of experiencing a fatal overdose. This was only four less than the Bronx. And the reason why it's hard to see those numbers when we're looking at rate of what's going on in Brooklyn is because Brooklyn is highly populated. We have a lot of people in Brooklyn. So we're looking at rate, we're taking in consideration that death in regards to that impact is having on that larger population size. So when you have a lot of people in Brooklyn, it's harder to really see that rate by just looking at that, that one side of the numbers. You have to look at how many people have we lost. And we see that Brooklyn definitely has something going on. So we know in 2017, when someone had experienced a fatal overdose, um, we get information from the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner, and we know that 82% of all fatal overdoses in 2017 involved an opioid of some sort. Remember I said, I need you to remember what naloxone does or what Narcan does. Can someone just kind of tell me what that is? So it's a safe medication that does what? Prevents 
or reverses opioid overdoses, very specific to opioids, right? But we still know the vast majority of them a fatal overdoses included an opioid. The vast majority of fatal overdoses had the potential of being prevented. We have this medication, this tool, that can prevent them from being fatal, but we still see that a large majority of fatal overdoses still included an opioid. If there was someone there to respond, someone to call 911, someone to give naloxone, that number could be a lot lower. So looking at more specific drug categories, um, looking at the lower part of the graph, you see heroin or fentanyl, cocaine, benzodiazepines. So these are the benzos, the drug categories of drugs such as Valium, Xanax, opioid analgesics. Remember how I said those are the, the prescription painkillers that you might recognize with the names of Vicodin, Percocet, the Oxys, and Methadone. So looking at these percentages, so from heroin or fentanyl down to methadone, these do not equal 100%. And that is because when someone has experienced a fatal overdose, it is likely that there's multiple drugs at play. So mixing of drugs, as mentioned before, is a risk factor. And we'll talk more in detail about some other risk factors when we get to um, a discussion about that. So we know that fentanyl is now the most common substance involved in, in, in drug overdose deaths. So harm reduction is all around us. We may not recognize it, but this concept of how we lower risk is pretty consistent throughout society. So has anyone ever driven a vehicle? Raise your hand. You are driving something that could potentially harm or hurt someone and possibly kill someone. However, we still drive, right? So what is something you can, you, we usually tell people to do? You want to learn how to drive, you have to get a what? A license, that is harm reduction. We say you have to be trained to deal with this, this vehicle. What's the next thing we say? You get in the car, you should first do what? Put on your seatbelt. Seatbelts weren't always a part of cars. But we know if someone has a seatbelt on and they get into an accident, it lowers that risk of this, this, this collision possibly being harmful or even fatal for someone involved, right? These are all harm reduction strategies that we just have in normal, everyday life. So what can someone do who uses drugs to lower those risks? So if someone has, uh, say, gotten out of incarceration and they say what's going to appear on this next part of the slide is not, is not going to be not using drugs. When someone is ready to make that change and they have the support and resources to do so, then that will happen. But what are things people can do in the meantime? So one, the, the last one says, using a loan. What can someone do to lower their risk? Yes, a buddy system. Do not use a loan. The reality is if you use a loan and there was an emergency situation where someone's experiencing an overdose, no one can respond. However, some people may choose to use a loan and we do respect that. But making sure there's a system in place where someone can still check on you in a certain amount of time. So sending a text saying, hey, can you check on me in five minutes? And if I don't respond, come looking for me. This still gives someone a chance to respond and prevent this from being fatal. If someone has stopped using drugs for a period of time because they were in incarceration and they wanted to use drugs once they came out, can we tell them something? So I'm seeing heads yes, that we can tell them something to lower their risk. But what are these things that we can tell them? So if someone says, before I was incarcerated, I used two bags of heroin in a day, would I suggest to that person to start off with two bags? No, start with half, start with less. Those are real and practical things people can do to lower those risks. Carrying naloxone, so having access to naloxone and making sure that others know how to use it. And when, not, when we say don't use alone, we also mean not at the same time. We do not want people to all be in that same medical emergency at the same time. And when someone is ready to make changes to opioid drug use, 
having the conversations with their clinicians and, and getting support around medication for addiction treatment with methadone or buprenorphine. 